Hello and welcome to a extremely finely balanced, because I don't have an overhead tripod, Constance in Isolation video. Um, I'm afraid there will also be some shadow just because of my natural lighting and electric lighting situation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about making covered buttons or perhaps more accurately what to do when you maybe want to practice making covered buttons when you're waiting for the proper um, materials you need for your grand court suit or beautiful jacket and you just want to have a go at making making some practice buttons with materials available to you. Here we have some examples of button moulds available from button suppliers. I think these came from Gina Barrett but Burnley and Trowbridge also sell the same. You can buy them in wood, plastic, bone, horn, depending on your levels of authenticity desired. These are also button moulds. These are for doing embroidered buttons like dorset buttons. Uh, the plastic one here is quite good for practising because it's larger and you can get the hang of doing the stitches. I think they also came from Gina Barrett. These ones are antique brass rings designed for making dorset buttons, so I just happened to find those, but you can buy modern ones too. You can also use modern washers and split rings, but you don't get such a perfect, perfect result. But again, they're very good for practising. So these are all available to buy. So what do you do if you're stuck at home waiting for your delivery of buttons, or maybe you're trying to save your pennies at the moment because of the world we're, we find ourselves in? What can you do instead? Well, this is what I do instead. Coins. Now you might think all oh, that's expensive, but actually I find a 2p coin, which you can't buy much with these days unless you've got them together, is a really good size for making buttons. Um, they are obviously a bit heavier than the button moulds, but you know if you're putting them onto a coat or if you're just using them as practice, why not give it a try? I've also got some English pennies as well. Um, but if you don't feel like using your money and you think what a waste, how about what we all have left over in pockets and jars from holidays? Holiday money. So, oh, well, that's also a penny. But I've got some, um, this is where I'll get them wrong, I've got some quarters, some cents and possibly a dime here. Um, and they're actually a little bit thinner than the English coins, so they're a bit lighter. So you might have some some coins left over from a holiday and you can use these as your button mould. Now I'll show you some examples of buttons made using both the proper moulds and, and my improvised ones. So here are some covered buttons that I've made. Um, going by the look of them, this one has a two pence piece in it completely on its own. These two have got a two pence piece inside as the mould but I've also put a layer of wadding in there as well just to give it a slightly cushioned more rounded look so it's, I've just put a circle of polyester wadding in like this when I've made the button and I'll demonstrate how to do that when I show you and um, I don't know whether you can see but it, it does it does change the profile of the button a little bit so that's completely flat you get some slightly hard angles from the edges of the coin but this has just a slight squishiness and a little bit of a little bit of coziness to it from the wadding and it just gives you a slightly nicer finish. The sort of buttons I'm aiming for here and the time I've used this before was on 18th century waistcoats and 18th century coats. So it needs to be a garment with a bit of tailoring or a bit of body to it so that the button isn't too heavy for it. I wouldn't recommend doing this with um, you know, a fine dress and you know, or something, something sort of, I don't know really, I think something very fine might struggle a bit with the weight of the button, as you would if you were putting a plastic button or a metal button on something. Think about it and test it in the garment. But yeah, so I'm thinking, last time I used this on an actual garment, it was an 18th century waistcoat and frock coat, and this is how I made the buttons. So here are some more. Uh, this one is a, uh, a two pence covered with fabric and wadding. That's a two pence on its own. And these two, I think, are actually have our button moulds. So these have got button moulds in, but no wadding. So you can see they look they look much the same. You do get slightly a, a slightly more blunt look around the edge. Another fabric you can do this with and get really nice results with is wool, because it's obviously got a bit more 
is a bit softer it molds nicely and it just looks really nice so here's two more buttons one one with with wadding and one without so that's the one without and that one's with so I think that again is a two pence piece sorry it's not in the best of light there and that one I think that's a one pence piece but that's got no wadding in it so now I'll show you how to cover cover a button mold or a penny as desired sorry about the shadows in this okay so to start with you need the fabric you're going to make your buttons out of for my examples I've got this leftover scrap of a ribbed silk which is quite pretty and looks similar to some of the fabrics you might see on 18th century court uh, court suits and I've also and on the back you can see I've drawn circles for covering the buttons and once you've cut them out you have something like this now the exact size you need for covering your button uh, you can get by obviously measuring your button mold finding its diameter and then adding that uh, half of that distance again round the outside because what you're doing is bringing the fabric in into the mold and covering it up and the way I find this easiest to do is to draw around, find a, find what size I need my circle, and then find another item that's also round that will that will produce the right size circle for me. So these are some of the things. Sorry, some of the shapes I draw around to get perfect circles. I think I use this pin cushion, which has a nice nice round round base, and I drew around that to get these shapes. So first of all, find your button mould, measure your button mould, and find a nice circle to draw around. That's my same rule when making any sort of circle or sort of millinery based thing. Find a plate that's the right circumference and draw around it, then you've got your perfect circle. For the decorated buttons, I've got this lovely, uh, the more fancy buttons, I've got this lovely scrap here. And it's these flowers that I'm using to make my, to make my buttons out of. So you obviously need to identify where your pattern is on the reverse and draw around those as well. This fabric froze a bit so I've gone for slightly bigger circles and then it doesn't matter if I sort of lose a bit in cutting it and working it with my fingers while sewing it. You also need some polyester wadding or some wool. So there's a scrap of polyester wadding with some circles the right size. The right size to cover the penny, the two pence piece completely and just sort of wrap round and wrap round the edge a little bit so you end up with these. So for the first button demonstration you need your button mould, piece of wadding and your desired, desired fabric. And next you need some thread. This is a silk thread but any sort of good thick buttonhole thread or linen thread will do the job as long as it, you won't be able to pull it quite tightly so if you're going to using a normal cotton thread double use a double thread if you're using a buttonhole twist a single strand should be fine and a needle and if you sew with one which I recommend you do a thimble so cut yourself a reasonable length of thread not too long not too short enough to do some little running gathering stitches with let's see if I can thread a needle on camera unlikely I suspect and also just put a knot at the end. I know you don't always do that. Some people fasten on, some people fasten off, but in this it's quite easy, it's quite useful to have a, a solid knot. So take a circle of fabric. This one, this is the right side, so starting on the wrong side. And this is where I am gonna have to see if I can do this, see what I'm doing both on screen and on my fingers, and make sure you can see it. So fasten on with your knot or a little back stitch and just run a gathering stitch, just a little running stitch all the way around the outside edge of your circle. Can you see what I'm doing? Or maybe I should do this in a contrasting colour so you can see what I'm doing. Is it a bit better if I use this red thread? It's not really a contrast but it pains me to use something like a white even though you're not going to see the thread. 
So starting again, fastening on. might speed this up a little bit because it's probably not very interesting watching me do it carefully rather than how I would quickly just whiz a little running stitch around. Okay so back to where I'm started. Remember this is the wrong side of the fabric. Then you want your two pence piece and your bit of wadding. If you find it helps you can even stick the wadding to your two pence piece with a little tiny bit of double sided sticky tape just to keep it in place. So I've got button mould, two pence piece, uh, the, the right side of the fabric, just lay that over, over them both, turn it over to the underside and pull up the gathering stitches. You see? So that all pulls around nicely and make sure it looks nice and smooth and plump sorry and make sure it looks nice and smooth and plump with no obvious wrinkles on the right side and you do that by just pulling it tighter tighter on the back and then doing a couple of stitches through where you started and finished off just to keep it keep it fixed in one position like that and also try and push if you've got if it comes a little bit off center you can sort of manipulate it to make sure all of the raw edges are here on the in the middle of the button mold and there you are so just to make sure it really isn't going anywhere and doesn't fray or or um, come apart while you're sewing it onto the garment. Fasten on, do another couple of back stitches on the spot. And obviously if you're doing this with a completely matching thread, you're not gonna see these stitches at all. And then once you've fast done a few back stitches to hold it in place, I then work a stitch that goes from this side, sort of directly to the opposite side, come out and pull, pulling across like that, and then I do a few more of these just to seal up the raw edges. Um, this is a fairly rudimentary way of doing it. It's just to hold it all in place and make sure I don't get um, don't get any lumps, uh, lumps or gaps or frays in my in my fabric. If you go and look at Sostein's channel, she's got a tutorial on making absolutely beautiful embroidered buttons for an 18th century court suit. I would thoroughly recommend you go and have a look at hers to see some really, really beautiful examples. So once I've done my few stitches across like that, which if, as I said before, if you were doing it in a matching thread, they would blend in much more. Have another look on the right side to make sure it's looking nice. And then, and there you have it. And now you can, if you've got a long enough thread here, you can leave this on for when you come to sewing your button onto the garment, or you can just fasten off and cut it short. And then when you come to sewing all your buttons on, you can start again. And the way you would sew this on is using this. So once you once you go to sew it onto a garment, it, obviously there isn't a shank here, but you just use the fabric of the back of the button to sew it onto your garment like this so you can sort of go in and pull it through and come out and fasten on really securely and sew it on like a button so you create your own shank. So there's button number one 
obviously if you were sort of then wanting to embroider over this you could do a little bit of decorative stitches on the button or you could do like the did on 18th century court suits you could draw out your circles on your fabric um when you know what size they need to be what size your what diameter your button is do the embroidery flat and then cut out the circles and sew them on and sew them onto the button moulds. You can do it either way, but sometimes you could do a little bit of decorative stitching on the outside if you wanted to now. Although the more common 18th century practice was to do it before assembling the buttons. And so just to demonstrate again, here's the more decorative fabric I want to make a button out of. This is the right side. This is the wrong side, although it is a fully reversible fabric. I have speeded up this section of film just so you're not watching me do the same thing painfully slowly again. I hope that's all right and it's still helpful seeing it at this sort of speed. It's no different to how I've done the first button, just a small gathering stitch all the way around the outside of the circle and then placing the wadding and the button mould inside and pulling the thread tight. And now we go back to normal. So here I am again, I've just put the two pence piece in with the wadding, make sure the pattern's sitting nice and centrally and pull the gathering up tight. And then again you might want to just adjust to get the nicest bit of the pattern sitting nice and centrally. I'll just pull this tight and fasten on and then I'll carry on with what I was saying about buttons. Something else I do if I don't feel it sitting quite as smoothly as I would like, it is a little bit like you I don't know whether it is even like a sewing, a dressmaking technique, but I sometimes go around where it's gathered with my needle again and just go through, through all the gathers near the edge of the button on the underside. And then once I'm all the way around, like that, you can pull that gathering tight as well. And that just smooths, smooths the edge, so you don't get any any sort of harsh pokes from the gather. You get a nice a nice rounded edge, and you can also pull that thread tight. Do a couple of stitches. Fasten off, and then go back to the middle and do those stitches across here just to neaten off any fraying fraying bits of the fabric and this is quite a fray fabric so you might need to do a few more stitches on this one sorry that's my phone which is normally on silent And there we are. That would look lovely on a waistcoat of the same fabric. If you had it on the centre front. Or if you were working maybe with the other side of the fabric, you could use the contrast as well. And there you are. A little decorative button. Again, you can leave a trailing thread if you want, or you can fasten off on the back and cut it short and then use a new thread if you're going to sew them onto a garment. So here are my examples using flat pennies as button moulds. Um, I've also got some little domed washers here that I think are designed to work with roofing nails. But if you wanted to make a more um, rounded button mould, you could use something like this. Again, these are all things you can use while you're practising uh, and waiting for your proper button mould to finish off, to, to arrive in the post. What I was going to say earlier on was when I first had a go at making buttons like this 
the um I posted it on Instagram and people were telling me stories from the past of of people who were maybe uh, fleeing from difficult times or smuggling, hiding their gold and silver and uh, expensive coins in exactly the same way as I made buttons and then sewing them onto their garments and then smuggling them across borders. I think one of the stories I was told was of a lady f fleeing the Russian Revolution who sold all, sewed all of her gold coins into into buttons and sewed them onto her clothes and managed to leave the country with them like that. I think there possibly is some evidence of buttons being used as currency in the past as well. One of the reasons I got the idea for doing this is because in one of the very early Sharp books by Bernard Cornwell, I think it's Sharp's Rifles, it's mentioned that Sharp has silver buttons down the outside of his trousers and as he's really poor and as the book goes on he cuts off more and more of the buttons on his trousers to pay for various things until he has no buttons left on his trousers. It doesn't say how his trousers then stay done up. Maybe that's just a, a non-costume person's lack of detail. Um, and at the end of the book, he steals a pair of trousers off a dead French cavalryman. And then for all the other sharp books, it's mentioned that he wears French cavalry trousers. So for some reason, that stuck in my mind as a way of using buttons as currency. And that led me to using my my either leftover holiday money or two pence pieces as button moulds. So I hope that was enjoyable. Here we are, some more examples. And then the actual button moulds as well. So I hope that was fun and informative and that you could see what I was doing. And I hope you enjoyed it.